When it comes to quality sleep, Ashley has you covered with top mattress brands at winning prices and with special financing options available. You can snooze now and pay later. Plus, your mattress purchase helps give the gift of better sleep to children in need and U.S. Special Operations Forces. Visit your local Ashley store or shop online today and make every snooze count. Financing is subject to credit approval. See store or ashley.com for details. Rosetta Stone is the language learning program with a lasting impact. I've been using their app to learn French, and it's not just about memorizing words, but actually having real conversations. And it's not just French. They offer 25 languages. Right now, Rosetta Stone has an awesome holiday deal, 50% off their lifetime membership. Every language, unlimited access forever. For anyone keen on diving deep into a new language, check out rosettastone.com. It's a game changer. Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you are doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me as always, well, out of all the true crime podcasters that I admire, he's close to being one of them. He is the captain. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It's good to be seen, and it's good to see you. Thanks for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. Thanks for joining us every week. We love you. Today we are drinking Cherry Spadina Monkey by the good people at the Indie Ale House in beautiful, sophisticated Toronto garage grade. Four out of five bottle caps. Yum. If you like sour ale, then this one's for you. Cherry Spadina Monkey is, of course, fruity, sweet, and tart. I would say that it's a medium sour level and it has mild cherry flavor. And we're drinking in the garage because of these little monkeys. Meg from Syracuse University. Next, we have Mary from Arlington, Texas. She says, thanks, guys, for covering the boys on the tracks case. And a big shout out to Brett Cephas from Cecil County, Maryland. And last but not least, we have Jamie Danielle from St. Louis, but moving soon to parts unknown. Jamie has a question, a question for the captain. She wants to know, has anyone... The answer is no. (laughs) Go ahead. What's the question? Jamie writes, has anyone told you you sound like Polly Shore? Only when I'm whizzing the chick. Nice try, Captain. Thanks to everybody for filling up the fridge for this week. If you want to buy us around for next week's show, go to truecrimegarage.com and click on the donate button. And if you'd like to support the show and get something back in return, check out our store page. We have a bunch of different shirts. Check those out. And we also have some beer mugs if you're into that kind of thing. And if you need a little more garage, don't forget you can go to the iTunes store and check out our bonus show, The Bricka Family Murders. All right, that's enough of whizzing the juice. All right, everybody gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. The first package containing what appeared to be a human hand was opened by staff at Falls Creek Elementary School after 1 p.m. today. Another package containing what appeared to be a human foot was found by staff at St. George's School later this afternoon. I can't link it to anything right now. Um, As we progress in the investigation, we will provide as much information as we can. We have liaised with Montreal and we'll liaise with any other police agencies that we need to in the course of the investigation. This is a really traumatic or difficult um, situation for absolutely everybody um, and that you know we're, we're doing our best to try and uh, make sure it's, is, uh, that our students are not um, negatively impacted as, as best as we can. Uh, it's obviously a very tricky thing to do uh, but we would want to try and try and really um, hammer home a con for, for people to have a calm uh, perspective on this where possible and that uh, uh, take, take um, I think we're hoping that people understand that we're doing our best in a very difficult situation. I just want to 
wanted to uh, break a little news uh, that I was just handed from my colleagues at the Sun News Network in that the Vancouver police have just uh, indicated that they're investigating finding two body parts, I repeat, two body parts sent to two schools in Vancouver. It's just breaking now. And so, I, you know, interesting you mentioned about the head earlier. We don't know what they are, but there's three pieces missing and there may be two have shown up, Jane. You said that to schools, these body parts were sent to schools? Yeah, uh, that's right. Um, they were sent uh, to two schools and they received them today. Vancouver police on the west coast here in Canada uh, have just, uh, they're, they're investigating it now. It's breaking just seconds ago. And um, it's, uh, so, you know, the, the clues, uh, I don't know what they are, Jane. We'll have to find out. But this puts it to five. And so it'll be interesting to see that your previous guest mentioned the head because, uh, you know, it could be there or maybe that is the trophy. And uh, that's the one piece that we don't know where it is. And it does remind us a lot of uh, Jeffrey Dahmer. There's no question about it. Particularly, you know, you deal with this Asian victim, uh, which there was the Jeffrey Dahmer case, and the fact there was just this brazen right in the middle of Milwaukee, here right in the middle of Montreal, and also Berlin. Very crazy well, stuff, go. Jane. It's very crazy. It's very disturbing. Well, let's listen to the news conference that ended literally moments ago out of Vancouver. Law enforcement describing two body parts that showed up at schools. The Vancouver police are investigating two disturbing incidents in which human remains were discovered in separate packages mailed to two local area schools this afternoon. The first package, containing what appeared to be a human hand, was opened by staff at False Creek Elementary School after 1 p.m. today. Another package, containing what appeared to be a human foot, was found by staff at St. George's School later this afternoon. Unbelievable. Robin Walensky, anchor reporter, The Blaze, do you think this is the tip of the iceberg from your many years covering crime? Jane, I, I think there's going to be more. I think he started with the animals. He didn't get high enough, and then he moved on to humans. Uh, I listened to that news conference live with you here, and uh, what strikes me about it is is that from a CSI perspective, this is a treasure. Those two boxes that were sent to the school, Jane, they have the wrapping, they have the tape, they have possible fingerprints, the material possibly in plastic if he put the body parts in there. They will take those two boxes and compare them to the one box that was sent to the Canadian Prime Minister, to Stephen Harper's Conservative Party, and then to the fourth box that was sent to the Liberal Party. They will look at all four of those boxes and compare and contrast. The 29-year-old suspect we're looking for is Roca Luca Magnota. You get a picture of the suspect, you get his name also. He's also known with the second name, which is Eric Clinton Newman. This is the 29-year-old suspect we're looking for uh, involved in this 11th homicide on the Montreal Territory this year. Um, you get a picture of the suspect, we're looking for him. Uh, a warrant had been issued. Uh, this is a coast-to-coast -coast warrant. We're looking for the suspect, and if anyone got information for us, uh, they will have to dial 911. This is a priority for us. We really need to get a touch of that suspect as soon as possible. We know that suspect and victim, they knew each other, so it's not a random attack. They knew each other. Um, the victim that we found, uh, the identity is not confirmed yet, but we know something for a fact. This is a male, uh, a white male. This is what we get. Uh, we're waiting for confirmation of his identity. As you know, part of the body was just dismantled, so for us it's hard to establish his identity. We had all the reasons to believe this is connected. Um, although we don't have any 100% confirmation why that is, because we do need a DNA match to confirm that 100%. But we've got all the reasons to believe this is the same body. That had been said, we're still missing a few parts of the puzzle uh, in terms of body parts. And uh, so, yes, this is a, a special crime scene. The, the crime was horrible, but suspect and uh, victim, they knew each other. I'm not going to tell you I'm happy to say you that, but at least it wasn't a random attack. This is horrible. No one deserved that, but at least suspect and victim, they know each other, so it wasn't a random attack. And that I can confirm you as a fact.
May 26, 2012, Roger Renville, a lawyer in Montana, he is enjoying his day off from work. He will spend part of his Saturday surfing the internet. Roger starts off by checking his email, messaging some friends, and then looking for a new funny video posted. Roger sees a bizarre internet video titled One Lunatic, One Ice Pick. He clicks on the video to view it. The video shows a man tied to a bed, and then the camera shuts off. When it continues, the man on the bed is dead. Then a man comes into frame and goes over to the lifeless body on the bed and begins stabbing the corpse repeatedly with an ice pick over and over again. Then with a knife, the suspect is going to dismantle the victim. The following day, Roger can't get the video out of his head. A lot of stuff on the internet is fake, but Roger couldn't help but believe that the video was real. Mm -hmm. It looked awfully real to him. So Roger believes that he had seen a genuine snuff film. He alerted the U.S. and the Canadian police and reported the internet video. Both countries' authorities dismissed the video as a fake. So we have this situation here, Captain. We have somebody that spotted a very gruesome video, and mm -hmm. I didn't go into a ton of detail. That's not our thing. Exactly. Well, the thing here is, Captain, you know, people upload these shocking videos to different websites, mm -hmm. and then what, what boggles my mind is that then people record themselves watching those videos and, and getting their reaction. Yeah, called reaction videos. The thing here is I never saw this video, thankfully never saw this video, one lunatic and one ice pick. Mm -hmm. And even when we, you know, decided to cover this case, I know that it's been taken down from the, uh, the best gore.com website where it was originally uploaded to. Mm -hmm. It was about a 10 or 11 minute video. Um, I'm sure it's probably hidden somewhere in the dark corners or dark attics and basements and crawl spaces of the internet. You can still find it in the deep web. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm glad. I didn't go looking for it because I didn't want to see it. Uh, the thing here is, like I said, it's 10 or 11 minutes. Not seeing it myself, trying to describe the video is tough for me to do. But but the thing here is, you know, there were other things in that video that, that we didn't get to. There, there, there were acts of necrophilia. There was the dismemberment. There's also a portion of the video where, where a dog is involved in, in, chewing on the body and what we were talking about earlier is that it kind of seems like uh this video was staged i mean there was mm -hmm. music playing we have new order uh the song was true faith this was uh, a release from 1987 yeah i've not seen the video but but the way it's been described to me captain is it somebody didn't just willy-nilly set up a camera and decide mm -hmm. to record this like you said it appears to be staged it also appears to be planned out thought out like you said putting together a soundtrack for the future video. Yeah, so at this point in the timeline, we have some people that we have an audience for this video that have seen the video, but we have no confirmation if this is actually real or if this is just a false video. On the morning of May 29th, 2012, around 10 a.m., a janitor working at an apartment building in the Snowden district of Montreal mm -hmm. makes a grisly discovery. Amongst bags of garbage and old discarded furniture, he finds a suitcase and he decides to open it up. Inside the suitcase, the janitor finds a human torso. The authorities are called. Upon arrival, the janitor tells the police that he first saw the suitcase four days earlier, mm -hmm. but there was so much trash and he had so much to do that this was the first he could get around to collecting everything. Police started searching the trash in the alleyway for remaining body parts. Right, and this is not going to be the only body part that we find that day. No, because just about an hour later, this is 200 kilometers away at the national headquarters for the Conservative Party of Canada, lo located in Ottawa. Mm -hmm. The office received their mail just like any other business day. Typically, the office would receive the usual stuff, you know, bills, letters, packages, big and small, on this day, there was one particular package that stood out from the rest. This was not a particularly large package, smaller than average size, but the box is labeled with a red heart symbol. All right. Maybe we shouldn't open that one. Well, according to the return address, that package was mailed from a Rene Bordelais. The office assistant in charge of receiving and distributing the mail started to open the box. Inside, she could see something wrapped up. But what was more alarming 
was that the the package it, it stunk. Uh, there was an extremely foul odor coming from this package. Uh. She noticed what she thought to be blood stains on the bottom of the box. The assistant stopped what she was doing. She was too disturbed and upset to open the package any further. She took the small box to her boss. Her boss opened up the box. Inside, there were uh, pieces of bright pink tissue paper stuffed inside the box to protect the contents from being damaged. The contents, well, there were something soft and mushy wrapped in a black garbage bag. Um, she asked the assistant to bring her a pair of scissors and as she cut open the bag, she noted that strong rotting smell right. just kind of blowing out at her there from, she, she, she now knew for certain that there was something very not right about this situation. Right. But that's when you stop, you call the police and you have them open it. You shouldn't open packages like that. And you're, you are exactly right, Captain. That's exactly what she did. They called the Ottawa police. They came quickly. Um, and it would be their job to finish opening up this package. Inside, the officers found a severed left foot, and they found a note. And the note read, Stephen Harper and Laureen Teske will know who this is. Oh, and I kind of forgot this was in here, Captain. So I, I do apologize in advance, but I'm just reading somebody else's words. The note from what I could find, read Stephen Harper and Lauren Teske will know who this is. They fucked up big time. Mm. Um, like I said, I believe there's more to that note. Uh, but the people that are named here, who is Stephen Harper and Lauren Teske? Well, I, I got I to gotta throw in my ignorance here. I didn't know who these people were. Mm. Uh, Stephen Harper at the time was the prime minister and Lauren is his wife. So it appears to me that this might be some kind of tease or taunting, you know, when you throw in a big name like the prime minister right. into into a, a, an awful package like this, we clearly have a victim, but but the mention of Harper and Teske likely think? well, but I'm saying the the mention of these two people, these important mm-hmm. people likely has no bearing on the case or its investigation. These crime packages being delivered won't stop there for that day. Right. So we have the horrible package that was received at the headquarters for the conservative party. The police, the investigators have a full blown, you know, what one would assume will easily turn into a homicide case. Mm -hmm. They are on high alert. They are going to go to the Canada post. That's the country's primary postal operator. Right. Uh, There they find a similar package. This one is addressed to the liberal party of Canada and again, it is from Rene Bordelais. Does it have a heart shape on the box? I, you know, I was looking for that. I, I found in one article that it said that there was a heart shape, bo- heart shape symbol on mm-hmm. this second package, but most of the articles never mentioned that. So I don't know if they just Can't got confirm it. it. I yeah. don't know. Yeah. I don't know if they just confused the two packages or if it, it in fact had the same thing, but the, the important thing here is you'll see the same name on the return address that, that Rene Bordelais Mm -hmm. inside the um, investigators uncovered more gruesome findings. This is a severed left hand again, along with a note. And this note said, you need to speak to Lauren Teske and her family. Lots to hide. All right. So that's the prime minister's wife, but we actually don't think that she's involved or he's involved in this crime at all. Or would even know anything about possibly the victim or the perpetrator of whoever's mailing these, these horrible packages. Mm -hmm. But one could assume maybe that this is some kind of political act, you know, like, uh, I murdered, uh, for the reasons of some political action. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That somebody that wants to speak out or speak up for something, Uh, The investigators are able to trace the origin of these two packages to a post office near Montreal. Now there, they are sifting through the surveillance footage. Mm -hmm. Police find who they believe is the man that they will be looking for. They have video of a young man. The video shows a Caucasian male, possibly in his late 20s or early 30s, mm-hmm. dropping off several packages matching the two packages that were previously found. But but now they have to put a name to this face, the, the face of the man mailing the body parts. 
Well, now, a big mistake right away from you have identifiers on the box that you're mailing. Mm-hmm. That's a big mistake. Well, the name Rene Bordelais is going to have no ties to the person mailing out these packages. Mm-hmm. Meanwhile, back at the apartment building, remember the janitor found the torso there. After searching through the trash, police list their findings as such. The torso was found in the suitcase, but they also found bloody clothing. They found several sharp, blunt objects and papers, which they believe might identify a possible suspect. And just like the police did at the post office, they're going to want to look at this surveillance footage of the apartment complex very closely. On it, they see who they believe to be their suspect, a 29-year-old man by the name of Luca McNada. Uh, the footage from the surveillance camera showed Luca bringing numer- numerous garbage bags outside. Mm-hmm. Police learned that McNada had lived in the apartment building at 5720 DeCary Boulevard in apartment 208. And all the surveillance footage that we're talking about of the apartment scenes of him throwing away the trash and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. You can see online if you are interested in looking at that. The apartment 208 apartment is located on the building's second floor. Around 1130 p.m., the police go to the apartment, letting themselves in, and they find an apartment that is covered in blood. The apartment quickly becomes the central focus in the investigation. Mm -hmm. Inside, they find pink bed sheets soaked in blood, a purple blood streak shower curtain, And they find more blood in the refrigerator on the table and lots in the bathtub. Um, I had read one report that said that when they picked up the mattress, because they they believed because of the amount of blood that they found over on the mattress that Mm -hmm. the the killing had started there, that when they lifted up the mattress itself, there was so much blood absorbed by that mattress that it had soaked through to the bottom. So pretty quickly, law enforcement, they have the apartment, they have the location. They have now receiving these packages with severed limbs from a victim. We don't have the identity of the victim yet. And we also have surveillance footage of what we possibly believe is the suspect. We also believe that he lived in this apartment. So now we're getting some identity here. Mm-hmm. And what else do they find in the apartment as evidence? Well, for the most part, the apartment itself, it looked like it had been emptied out, like somebody was in the process of moving out of the apartment. Mm -hmm. Um, But they also find a cryptic message left on the wall. Uh, Somebody had wrote, if you don't like the reflection, don't look in the mirror. I don't care. Uh, It was obvious to investigators that this Luca McNada, who had lived at the apartment, had left the apartment and most likely left the area. Them believing that he is their suspect. At the same time, police are discovering additional footage from the building surveillance system. Mm -hmm. This is of Luca with a man of about the same age, uh, and he looks like like the likely victim here. Now, we've seen this video, Captain. Right, they're walking into the apartment building together. And it almost looks, yeah, it looks like they're walking in and, and Luca has some things in his hand. I don't know if it's, uh, you know, take out, carry out something like that, but he's, he's fumbling, trying to get the keys in the door. He's got to unlock the door. And the, there's really kind of a, a sad interaction that you see in that video because you know, we know the outcome of this situation, right? But even viewing that video for the first time, you're seeing what, what appears to be the suspect and the victim and where Luca, he looks like he's even wearing a wig to me. He holds the door open for his victim, for the, for the guy that he's going to kill here shortly. He holds the door for him in like a, a sweet manner. And then the victim steps inside mm-hmm. and, and, and stands there, turns and waits for Luca to come into the hallway with him. If you didn't know the outcome of this situation, you would think that you were looking at two friends walking together into a building. Yeah, or or possibly um, romantically involved. Yeah, you know. So yeah, I don't know. It's it, it's <sighs> those things are just as hard, you know, as far as the gruesome videos. Those are you know something I don't you know see, seek out to watch. Uh, but even these surveillance films, especially when once you know. 
that this this guy is going to end up being a victim, those are almost to me as as hard to watch. Mm-hmm. Well, with all of this this uh, surveillance footage that the police have collected, they agree that the footage from the apartment it looks a lot like the same guy that they have from the footage from the post office mailing the packages. So right, now that's, they, that's basically their confirmation. We've seen both and it looks identical. And then you found the torso at the apartment. We, we know what's going on here. At one point in the surveillance video, you know, like we talked about, you know, that we have the suspect and we have the victim walking in together. Mm-hmm. The victim's actually wearing like a yellow t-shirt of some kind. And then when Luca comes back out and he's, you know, taking out the trash and stuff, right. he's wearing the victim's shirt. Yeah, certain parts of that surveillance footage video really, really bother me and really tug mm-hmm. at the old heartstrings there. There's a lot more to get to about this case right after this quick beer break. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. Do you look forward to the holidays? Maybe you struggle with seasonal blues. This time of year can be a lot, and it's natural to feel some sadness or even anxiety about it. But adding something new and positive to your life can counteract some of those feelings. Therapy can be a bright spot, something to look forward to, to make you feel grounded, and to give you the tools to manage everything going on. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. Find your bright spot this season with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash garage today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash garage. Dreaming of overseas adventures or connecting more deeply with family from afar? Rosetta Stone bridges the language gap. I've tried others, but Rosetta Stone's immersive lessons and voice feedback technology are game changers. Dive into 25 languages by learning intuitively, just like when you were a kid. And here's the holiday sparkle. Grab a lifetime membership now and save 50%. Gift yourself the world. Head to rosettastone.com now and save 50%. Major phone carriers make you sign contracts with rigid data plans to trap you into a kind of forced phonogamy. Sounds pretty insecure if you ask me. At Consumer Cellular, we believe in a more consensual and healthy form of phonogamy, free of contracts and more flexible to your data needs. This way, you stick around not because we force you to with contracts and fees, but because you love our phone plans. Like ardently love our phone plans. Phonogamously. Consumer Cellular. When Freedom calls, we're here to answer. Call us at 1-888-FREEDOM. All right, we're back. Cheers, everybody. Thanks for the delicious beer. Big shout out to Amber Hook. Yeah, we got a message from your brother Todd on Instagram. So cheers to everybody out there. This brings us to May 30th, 2012. This is just the day after those two packages are received. And then the torso is found in the suitcase at the apartment complex. We have an international manhunt that is underway. This is, this is after Montreal police named Luca Magnata as their suspect and accused him of killing a man and mailing the body parts to various locations. Well, and looking into old Puka, uh, he's, he travels the world. Mm-hmm. You know, he's been known to travel to different locations. So this makes it, uh, you know, we have our suspect, but now we have a guy that is a known traveler to even other countries. So we got to catch this individual before this happens again. Police identify Luca Rocco Magnata, age 29, as the suspect. He is also known by the names Eric Clinton Newman and Vladimir Romanov. Uh, there are profiles circulating online describing him as a male model and a bisexual porn actor. Now, when I say that there are profiles circulating... There are a lot of profiles circulating, and furthermore, there are many, many photos of him online. And some of the photos aren't actually real. They're photoshopped. He kind of creates his own image. 
He's even <laughs> known to, you know, somebody will be in Miami and he finds somebody that kind of looks like him and he photoshops his head onto them. So it makes it look like he's traveling to Miami. Yeah. And you'll see a lot of photos that look like he's posing for maybe a magazine mm -hmm. uh, or you'll see pictures of him in fancy sports cars or in front of expensive properties um, and like, like the captain said, we don't know how many of these photos are photoshopped, um, where some, he, right. But some are, some of them are so clear mm -hmm. that, you know, so clearly photoshopped that, you know, they're pretty ridiculous. Um, he was just a very odd guy. Well, and the thing that you learn there is that he's, he's almost creating a personality. He's creating a lifestyle for you to see of him. Someone that's traveling the world. He, he's riding around in expensive cars, going to expensive places, creating a, a persona online for all of us to view and admire. Well, and on top of that, he's creating fictitious profiles. So then therefore those fictitious profiles could interact with the real profiles. So what do you do? He, he'd post a picture of something and then he'd go onto his fake profiles and like you know, the picture or comment on the picture. And he would like make up ridiculous claims like, uh, Luca's a, a, a big, huge celebrity here in Canada. He is, you know, he is God in Canada. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. every, every morning captain, when I wake up and I'm eating my lucky charm cereal, the first thing I do mm -hmm. is I go onto the Facebook page for true crime garage. And I like us. <laughs> You mean I wake up and I, after I eat my Lucky Charms, I I take off my diapers and I <laughs> my mommy powder my butt. Uh, yeah, okay, yeah, don't just, just stop, for that, stop liking us. I can see it. Just for that, tomorrow I'm going to like me and dislike you. The <laughs> on the following day, May thirty first, two thousand and twelve, the Montreal police they tell the Global News that they have information suggesting McNada had left the country. And they're pretty sure he's in Europe somewhere. Now, mm -hmm. media reports suggest that he may have traveled to France. But at this time, I mean, still really anywhere is a possibility, in my opinion. He he could be anywhere. He, he could still be in Canada or maybe even Russia. You know, we see from his online profiles, his online persona, that he talks about having Russian ties. That he well, might... The ties are... To the Russian mafia. Not only says that, but he also says that he is Russian, you know, mm -hmm. or that he's of Russian and Italian descent. So really he could be anywhere. Now on June 1st, the Montreal police identified the victim in Montreal's grisly murder and dismemberment case as missing Concordia university student, Jun Lin. Yeah. Now some people will say that his name is June Lin. And sometimes you'll say here, Lin June. Lin was a 33-year-old student from China. He was actually reported missing on May 30th. This is just one day after a janitor in Montreal found the torso of the man locked in a suitcase. Police are now saying it is possible that Jun Lin, the victim, and Magnata had some sort of relationship. Well, the thing here is, Captain, with, with Mr. Lin, he, his... His family suspected something was going on before he was actually reported missing. Mm -hmm. His his boss reported that he had not shown up for work on a particular day, and this was very unlike him. We also have his friends. They say that they hadn't seen him in days, so they reach out to his family, and this is where he's officially reported as missing. Now, how does he come in contact with uh, old uh, Puka? Well, the thing here is at first the police state that they had, they believe that the two might have had some kind of relationship. Um, and I think maybe part of that is from what they could witness from that apartment, from the apartment surveillance footage. Like I said, mm -hmm. it, it was almost like two friends walking in together or like you said, maybe somebody in a relationship together walking in together. Uh, but the situation was not that. The situation was that he had responded to some kind of ad that Luca McNada had placed looking for uh, companionship. Yeah, it's not that simple. The ad was more, wasn't it, to make a video? He was looking for somebody to join him in making a video, and I believe it was like a sexual video. Well, either way, we have the student, Lynn, responding to an ad. Um, there apparently, there was no long-term relationship. As far as I could find, 
Jun Lin had not even been in Canada for that long or in the area for that long for there to be a long-term relationship. And at this point, law enforcement is not releasing all the information on the notes that they found with the body parts. They're also not releasing a lot of the information or like some of the writings and stuff that they found in um, Magnata's apartment. And the reason for this and why the public is calling it into question so much is because, uh, I apologize, but, but there's no nice way of saying this. There are still pieces of the victim missing at this point in the investigation. Mm -hmm. You know, not only was Luca Magnata seen mailing several packages, but it was also communicated somewhere in those notes that six body parts had been distributed. And Luca was claiming that the perpetrator of this crime Mm -hmm. would most certainly kill again. So we have a threat with him being on the run. And we also have, uh, you know, evidence and portions of the victim that still need to be found. We do have a threat on certain people receiving these body parts. Mm -hmm. I mean, like we said before, some of the body parts were sent to school and luckily those were intercepted and, you know, no kid opened up those uh, packages. It's around this time in the investigation, captain, that the police now believe that the video published on May 25th titled one lunatic, one ice pick uh, again, that this is a video depicting the murder of John Lynn committed on camera by Luca Magnata. And there was actually a lot of reaction videos posted on this. Again, a lot of people not knowing that if, if it was real or it was hoax, uh, you can actually find the footage of that, of the reaction videos. Uh, I think playing any of that material would be out of distaste. They suspected him so much that at this point with Interpol, uh, in the search for Luca Magnata, they were listing what charges Luca would face if apprehended. And these charges included first degree murder, committing an indignity to a dead body, publishing obscene material, mailing obscene and indec- indecent and immoral material. Well, and not only that, but also threatening criminally uh, the, the prime minister, Stephen Harper. Yeah, along with several members of parliament. Now, Interpol issued a red notice uh, for Luca Magnata. What's the, a red notice? I don't, I don't know, but I'm guessing that that's a pretty. <laughs> I, I'm guessing the red notice is like the highest alert notice. Okay, you know, find this guy, pretty, pretty, please find this guy with the cherry on top. Uh, this is at the request of the Canadian authorities. Magnata is he is to be tracked down, apprehended, and he's going to be extradited back to Canada if they can find this guy. Mm-hmm. Now, the international police are learning quite a bit about McNada's movements after the murder. They learned that McNada had booked a round-trip flight from Montreal to France using a passport with his name on it on May 25th. This is just four days before they discovered the remains. Now, McNada would be a no-show, of course, for the return flight. After arriving in France, Magnata used a different passport to check into a hotel. Mm -hmm. The passport name was Kirk Trammell. Uh, After the manhunt for Magnata got underway, authorities were able to trace his cell phone. You know, Magnata, even, even, even though he's on the run, he's still using his phone. You know, many times on the show, we've talked about my theory that some serial killers are addicted to hunting or addicted to killing people. Mm -hmm. And of course, Magnata, he's a different breed of monster to me. He is someone that is addicted to his phone and addicted to checking the internet so much so that he can't stop himself from logging on. Well, and I think some of it too was he's trying to figure out what uh, law enforcement knew about the murders and did they have him as a suspect? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so they, they trace his phone to the hotel, but unfortunately... Magnata had left before they could track him down. So they they go to this hotel looking for Luca. They get there. He's no longer there. But they are on his trail now. And on June 4th, Luca Magnata is apprehended by Berlin police at an internet cafe. Yeah, and what is old self-obsessed shit-stained puka doing? He's in the internet cafe Googling himself. You know, and, and I heard if you Google yourself too much, you go blind. But so he's sitting there looking up, uh, I think, not only stuff about the case that's happening, you know, he's searching himself on Google Images. 
Yeah, and, he, and like you said earlier, he's reading news stories about himself as well, looking up pictures of himself. Now, when he's first approached by the Berlin police, he, you know, he says, "No, you got the wrong guy." He gives a fake name. He tries right, right. this several times, and finally, he ends up saying, "You know." He ends up admitting who he is, and later fingerprints would confirm this. Um, and he essentially leaves us without incident. You know, he, he gets apprehended and he leaves without incident. Now, on June 5th, that same year, a package containing a right foot was delivered to the St. George's School. Uh, another package containing a right hand was delivered to False Creek Elementary School in Vancouver. Uh, Both schools opened as normal the following morning. Uh, It was confirmed that both packages were sent from Montreal. And like the captain said, these things, these things were sent to schools and and luckily children didn't end up finding them or, or seeing them. Right. And then what they're looking for now is they're, they want to know, you know, we got Luca in custody. They're talking with him. They're, they're trying to figure out where June Lynn's head is. Mm-hmm. and that's because they want to give him a, a proper burial. Yeah, his family would like to return him to China. Now, the other thing that we have to be concerned with here is that are all of these packages belonging to the same victim? Right. And it wasn't until June 13 that the four limbs and the torso were matched to the victim, Jun Lin, using DNA samples from his family. And it wasn't until July 1st that the head was recovered at the edge of a small lake in a Montreal park after police received an anonymous tip. A lot of people suspect that that tip came from Luca himself, but I haven't been able to confirm that myself. It's quite possible. You know, they they do their investigations a little bit differently than we do. They up in Canada, they handle their news a little more discreetly when it comes to these types of situations. I'm just going over my notes here, Captain, and I wanted to talk about Jun Lin real quick here, our our victim. Mm -hmm. And I misspoke earlier. I have in my notes that he arrived in Canada in July of 2011. So he would have been there long enough for some potential uh, long-term relationship, but that was not the case. He did not have a long-term relationship with Luca Magnata. As we said, you know, he was, he was from China. He was going to go to college. He was seeking a degree in computer science Mm -hmm. um, from the Concordia university. I'm not certain, but I, I believe that I read that, you know, this was like a, uh, he was going to be one of the first, you know, he was certainly the first in his family to travel abroad and go to college. This was kind of not just his dream, but also the family dream. And, you know, one one piece of footage that I saw, re- you know, that really kind of really kind of affected me was, you know, when we talk about these victims, they're kind of we only get a screenshot, you know, just a very brief glimpse into their life. Because right. unfortunately, and, and I hate that it's this way, but unfortunately, the victims end up being the smaller part of the story, which is which is terrible because that's the worst part of the story. That's the part that lasts forever, the hurt that lasts forever. Now, the thing with with Mr. Lin here, not only was he young and outgoing, but there was a a video that I saw of him. He's singing karaoke, and you just get this vibe that this is is a, a really good guy, an outgoing person that's full of life and full of excitement. Uh, you know, and I saw some of his other posts where they were, um, text messages and and pictures that he was sending back to his family. And a lot of it was nature oriented and a lot of it was very, um, positive stuff. You know, look how beautiful it is out today. Things like that. So truly a good person that, that, that came across just a monster and, and we've lost him because of that. Yeah. Very, uh, tragic story. Yeah. And on June 18th, Luca Magnata was flown aboard a Royal Canadian Air Force plane back to Canada. Uh, they deemed that there were too many safety concerns to use uh, commercial flight back to, to transport him back to Canada. Now, soon after he arrives in Canada, his trial is going to begin. Well, and before the trial happens, they're going to be looking into old Puka Nahata. And as they're looking into this vigil, they're going to realize this guy's a sicko. Yeah. Right, and be long before the body parts, long before the murder, long before the the videotape being posted, 
he, he was doing some stuff that should have had them on the radar. If you know, to me, he should have already been locked up and put behind bars. Are you going to call him puka the whole time? You got me laughing the first time. <laughs> I'll call him whatever the hell I want to call him. <laughs> um, it doesn't bother me one bit, Captain. No, I agree with you. There were things going on and there were red flags going up that this whole tragedy might have been, may have never have happened had they picked them up for some of these other crimes. Mm -hmm. So once they start diving into this, we're going to ask, who is Luca Magnata? Hi, my name is Lou Luca. Magnot is my last name, M-A-G-N-O-T-T-A. Hi, Luca. How are you today? Good. How are you? Good to cover here. So, Thank right you. away, you know this is an underwear competition. I'm ask you to this row to cover the shirt right away. All right, definitely. John, how come like his voice is lower? Yours is lower. I know. I have a very deep voice. A lot of people tell me that, actually. Yeah. Not really good speaking voice. So how do you get your voice so deep? How do I get my voice so deep? Practice makes perfect, right? You got kind of a Ryan Philippe vibe going on. Right? A lot of people tell me that, like they remind me of like Fifty Four, that uh, movie, you know? Yeah, he so. has to be one of my favorites too. Oh, and really? Then, yeah, I think you look good. I think that that your body is a little bit slim. I used to be really overweight, to be on, honest. Uh, I used to be really overweight. And I lost like weight. Really? How did you do that? Oh, I just like got up every morning at like four o'clock and like ran constantly and people would tell me oh stop running stop running and I just kept doing it basically what's your idea of overweight I've got oh god I was I, I was I was a lot of overweight actually oh, really? so like you know I'm curious about your hair color what, what, is that natural uh no actually I just got to highlight it change oh, things up a bit yeah all right a little bit green I know that when you were swimming a lot I noticed some blondes tend to go in the chlorinated water <laughs> A little bit on the green yellow side. Uh, yeah, that's sure what happened to me. That. Yeah, for sure. A little bit healthier. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A little bit dried up. That happens sometimes, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, I think, he, I think he looks good. I think he has a chance. I'm going to give him a yes. Thank you. I think this competition is going to be a little bit built up, you know? Like, I, think I have no problem gaining weight. Like, I can gain weight if I need to gain weight. I'm actually thinking more muscle definition. I think, I think you do have a very nice... That could happen really quickly. I can yeah. gain weight really quickly. I'm gonna say potentially. I think you do have potential, but I'm gonna ask you to come back next year. This okay. Maybe. All right. All right. Looks like you. Wow. Um, Luca, I'm I'm surprised to see how you look because I think you look better in person in front of me than you look in your modeling portfolio. Okay. I think your photos are overexposed and blown out. And All right. Structure, and I think he has an interesting bone structure. Um, you know, I think those photos look good. I do. <laughs> I do. I think that they look very good. That's I think they look that's, hot. That's what attracted to me. I think he looks better in the photo. A lot of people tell me I'm really devastating legal looking, so. That, I mean, a picture like that is kind of a swollen. Yeah, but I think the problem is that what is good for cover eye isn't always what you're attracted to in your personal life. And okay. I know that he's very your type. Well, everyone has their personal point of view, like who who they like and who they don't like, basically. I just don't think he's beefy enough for cover guy. I don't think you have the musculature yet. I, I can I definitely say, can gain weight. Yeah, yeah, I know you say you can gain weight. But you got you won't think I can. How much weight can you gain in two weeks? I can gain muscle. Everybody can do it. You know, I can gain muscle. I can work out. I'm very determined, and every goal that I put my uh, mind to, I surpass. All right, so we uh, we learn what Luca is. I mean, Luca is determined, and whatever he puts his mind to, he accomplishes. He also comes off as somebody that's willing to be whatever you want him to be mm -hmm. to fit in. I mean, there he is trying out for, I believe that's his tryout for a, a thing called Cover Guy. Right. Um, now, he had done several of these tryouts. Uh, he's ultimately turned down for this this TV show or for the cover of a magazine, whatever this Cover Guy thing is. But uh, you hear him, you know, any anything that they point out that they might be looking for that's different, he's willing to fit the mold. He's willing to adapt himself physically and mentally to whatever they need. Which is definitely, I mean, you know, part of you feels for him, you know, part of you is you know, saddened 
that there's an individual out there that is willing to just be like, Hey, whatever you want me to be, I'll be. Yeah. But he was doing this well before his tryouts, you know, and this is what we talked about with his persona online that he's creating of himself. Well, he definitely has some, you know, self-loathing. He definitely has some kind of, you know, body dysmorphia. Uh, he, he has a lot of mental issues going on here. And we also learned that not only is he constantly changing his appearance with the use of makeup or dyeing his hair, right. changing his clothing, um, you know, he, he's always creating, he's always changing and adapting, but we also learned that he's had some cosmetic surgeries done as well. And we realized this because he does an interview, he's trying to become a contestant on a show. And if you win the show, you get cosmetic surgery. So let's go to this little clip of uh, Luca Magnata talking about his plastic surgery and, and his viewpoints on that. All right, my name is Luca Magnata and I'm 25. And what do you do for a living? I'm a model. Okay. Do you want to talk about the other stuff that you do? Yeah, or? definitely. Is that okay with uh, you? Yeah, okay, that's great. All totally fine. Super. Basically, um, I do a lot of uh, adult modeling and um, I do adult films as well, and I'm pretty comfortable in front of the camera, so I've <laughs> been doing it for a while, and it's been working out pretty good for me, so. And you do it full time? I do, it's full time, whether it's doing the films, or doing magazines, or internet uh, shows, what have you, um, it's all very consistent, so it's been really good for me. That's great. How long have you been doing it? on and off for about two years now. You know, I travel and then I come back to Toronto and do it. I go to Montreal and do it. Go to LA, so whatever, right? Yeah, where the paychecks come from. Definitely. <laughs> <laughs> so what is the surgery you're thinking about having done or the procedure? Um, well, it's gonna be at the back of my uh, uh, head. I've uh, had three done, sorry, two done already. Can you and tell me what it is you're having done? Uh, it's a hair transplant. And basically, do you want me to just go on the bed of a sh- Yeah, tell me a little bit about the procedure, yeah. Okay, so basically, uh, the back of my head here is going to be uh, frozen. I'm awake through the entire procedure, and there's like no, uh, uh, what do you call that? Anesthetic? There's no, like, you don't get put under to sleep. Right. So basically, uh, they, they cut open the back of my head, and they take a strip of uh, flesh off, and they, they cut it off and they take it uh, to the side and nurses work on it for a few hours by taking each uh, individual hair out uh, of the graft. And then they sew the back of my head up and that takes about an hour. Uh, so they pull the skin down? Or yeah, they, they, pull they-, it, they pull it down and tighten it and sew it back up. Then while the nurses are working on taking the hairs out, uh, the doctor puts me back and he tries to decide where exactly all of them are going to be needing to be placed so it looks very natural. Okay. And uh, as you can tell here in the front of my head, all, the hair has grown in pretty nice because it used to be receding, so it's, it's grown in. And um, so basically they take all of the individual hairs and one by one they put it, transplant it into my scalp. And um, wherever they feel it needs to be. Yeah, definitely. So it's all filled in, and there's no. I guess basically uh, at the back of my head here, it's I, I cover it well with my hair, but uh, it's the uh, it's going uh, not bald, but I don't have <laughs> denial here. You know what I mean? I guess you can say it is kind of going bald then, but it's, I, I just every time I look in the mirror, it, it seems to be getting worse. So I want to like completely. Yeah. Eliminate it and stop it, you know, before, obviously, because I can't have my hair looking uh, like I'm 50 years old when I'm 25, right? So I want it to look pretty good. Yeah. And um, I've had cosmetic surgeries done in the past, so I'm pretty used to them. And What have you had done in the past? I've had my eyes done here, because I used to have dark circles underneath my eyes, and it was completely making me look like I was tired all the time. Um, I've had my nose done. I've had uh, two hair transplants, like I said before. And I'm planning on doing muscle implants in my pecs and my arms. So that just remains to be seen, but because that's pretty. You think you're a bit awesome. of an addict? <laughs> yeah, I, my name's Luca, and I'm a cosmetic surgery addict. 
but yeah, I I would say to be out to be blatantly honest, I I think that I I am because just the profession that I'm in, it makes me more aware of my looks because I'm constantly seeing other people, you know, that are extremely good looking, how they look, and I'm comparing myself. So I need to um, step up my game basically, and that's why I'm having all these procedures done. Do you feel it's more a modeling thing or more of an adult entertainment thing? Do you feel the pressure? I would say it has to be both because both industries are so competitive uh, that they, they, they both need you to look your best all the time and there's just a lot of stress and a lot of anxiety uh, in both industries. You know, so I, I have to say a bit of both, definitely. There's pressure to look good. There is so much pressure to look good because you're you're on set with these other people and you know you, you see how they look and then after you, all your little flaws start coming out and you're like oh well you know this person looks that way and they have this sort of body this sort of face and hair and now I compare myself to this person so he has like fuller hair so now I want fuller hair he has a better nose so I want a better nose and this person's face doesn't have those so why should I have it if I can just pay for it to have uh, it taken away and corrected why, why not I don't any problem with it. You look like you're, I mean, you're a handsome guy. I can't imagine you weren't that handsome before. You know what? A lot of people tell me that they say, you know what? Oh, you don't need it. You don't need it. But before I was, uh, I was good looking, but it was starting to fade and I was starting to get very self-conscious with that. And I, I couldn't, I could not deal with having my looks go, you know, because before it was receding, like I was saying, and my nose was a bit different. And my, you know, now I just take very good care of myself by going to the gym all the time, working out, you know, eating properly. So I don't want to. It would kind of defeat the purpose if I was doing all of that exercise and then, you know, looking kind of ugly. Like because when I'm in the when I'm when, seriously when I'm in the uh, the chair and they're doing like say my hair or something, or they can say, oh well, we, we better. It, it really gets to me because they say to me. We better cut it uh, a bit longer at the back because we can see that it's starting to. And I'm like, don't even tell me that. Do not even tell me that it's starting to get uh, thin at the back. Because I don't want to hear. I'm in denial, like I said about it. So I'm like, okay, I, I've been hearing it so much lately. And the other act, like the actresses who I work with, they're like, um, yeah, it's kind of. They like point it out. And I'm like. You know what? That is not nice. <laughs> okay, I don't want to hear it. So, but they do tell me it, and you know, I guess uh, I have to hear it because you know, just reality. So, how how important are your looks to you? Oh my God! If, if that's number one, okay. Number one is looks. Number two would have to be intelligence, and I don't know what the rest are. <laughs> all I do, all I care about is number one. Basically, all I do is care about how I look um, by getting clothes basically because you know what when you're going out to parties when you're going to events when you're going traveling everywhere you don't you have to constantly wear something new all the time you know you can't keep, you know it's very it's very it's a very strange industry but not a lot of people can understand unless you're in it you know so do you think um i enjoy it though <laughs> yeah have you always been obsessed with your looks like i mean i have like seriously people say to me all the time even when I was a teenager, they're like, oh, you're completely vain. All you do is like stare in the mirror. If you walk by a mirror, all you do is like glance and then look at it, you know. When you're in a restaurant, you just like take like a, your, like your spoon, just like do a little like look in it and, you know, try to like check and see if you're okay. And a lot of my friends and family have been saying, you know what, you're obsessed with it. You're just so obsessed with how you, how you look and so obsessed with your cosmetic surgeries that we don't understand this, you know. We don't, just don't understand you're becoming somebody completely different and then going into an an industry where it's all about your looks it is you know so w w when you go from you know when you're in high school or something and your looks you know they're they're important but not like everything then you just go into an industry like people on their day-to-day -day jobs like who are not even in this industry they really don't have to look their best they have to look presentable but they don't have to like look perfect but when you're doing this and you're in front of the camera basically it's a whole different story you know what I mean people judge you so much and it's it's not really nice but you know it's the way things are if you don't look good you don't look this way you can't get that job yeah. you can't get, do this have you ever heard of uh, body dysmorphic disorder have you heard of that term I've heard of it uh, briefly, briefly it, yeah 
I know that it's people who look good and they think that they look completely hideous. So I, I don't have too much knowledge into the whole thing. So you think, I mean, you don't think you look hideous. You think you look good. You just want to look even better. I think that I used to look hideous. And after that, after when I got all of my procedures done, I'm starting to look better and better. But I still feel as though I can look even more uh, handsome, you know, if yeah. I, get, I finish my journey into getting the surgeries done. Yeah. You know what I mean? Do you um, do you think it'll help you, like in the adult entertainment industry? Do you think this is going to get you more work or make you more money? I have to say that um, it would get me a lot more work if I do get the uh, hair transplant done because I noticed a difference when I didn't have it as opposed to now because before it was as though um, I noticed that the jobs were going more and more to the other people and after I got the procedures done I noticed that I was the one who was getting more and more of the work so now I'm like okay what it happens if I get um, more and more work done and that means I'm gonna get more and more work obviously and I think that once I get the <laughs> whoops yeah once I get the implants and pack implants and stuff because a lot of the guys I notice I work out like a nut so other guys who are getting uh, the jobs are like getting bigger bodies so I'm like you know what I'm just gonna follow whatever they do because they're getting bigger bodies and better bodies so that's gonna make me more money I have to do that I and mean, they're getting more jobs so I wonder why so I look at what they're doing and it just makes logical sense to me that I would do it too yeah so you think that having the surgery is going to make a big change in your life? It's going to make a drastically uh, different change in my life and it's just going to give me more self-esteem and like make me feel amazing about myself because it's very important for people to have high self-esteem and to feel good about themselves and if going under the knife can help somebody achieve that then I think that it's a great thing yeah you know um people just kind of people look at it as like a magical new experience but it's just it's not really that um different it's not really that bad you know when you go under your you know even though I'm awake you know like I can still feel them cutting open my head but it's not like you feel all the pain you know what I mean? But you just have to stay there for like hours and hours and feel them cutting open your head and putting it in. And you can actually feel like the blood dripping down the back of your neck. And, the, and it's kind of graphic. <laughs> I mean, like, <laughs> gross everybody out here, but it's like seriously graphic. Yeah. Um, what do you see when you look in the mirror now? Like, what? Oh, God. When I look at the mirror now, I just saw the little flaws just come out. And I'm just like, you know what? I can notice that. I can just, if I just, if I want to fix that I want to fix this and what other what other things I mean other than you, you, like there other stuff that you're looking to fix other than your hair and your packs okay you this gonna sound really weird but I've seen this other guy on a cosmetic surgery show and he had on his forehead hair he had like two little bumps in his skull and they protrude out of his forehead like there's two bumps here in my head because um, my bone sticks out a little bit on my forehead like there's two little bumps yeah and he had his grinded down, but he couldn't do it all the way because if he did, his, his forehead would collapse. So he had, they had to do, stop, but because he, he thought it looked like devil horns. And I noticed when I look in the mirror that I have the same thing too, like one here and one here. So I want I want to take it off my forehead. And I'm look at there, I'm like, damn, it's getting bigger and bigger on my forehead. So I just, I want that done and I, I like, is there, do you see an end to the cosmetic surgery? Like, will you ever be perfect in your own eyes? You know what? I just, I don't think I, I, I know that there's so much things I'm going to do. And I don't care whether or not I have to work every single day, every hour, I'll do it and get all my cosmetic surgeries done. Maybe there might not be an end. Maybe there will be an end. But I just know that I'm just going to keep doing it until I'm personally satisfied. Even if anybody else says to me, yeah. oh, uh, you know what, Luca? You look really good. I don't believe them. I just think they're saying that.
right. That's kind of an interesting look into the way Luca's Luca Magnata's brain works and how he views himself. That is from an audition from a show called Plastic Makes Perfect, which took place in 2008. Now, we still got a lot to get to as far as Luca Magnata goes. We got to talk about his early life, some other crimes that he has committed, and his trial. And we'll do that on tomorrow's show. And we also have a special surprise on tomorrow's show as well. I want to thank everybody for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. Thanks for sharing the show on social media. Check out our website, truecrimegarage.com, for anything. We have special, new, limited edition. We're only ordering a small batch of these. Computer Club shirts. You asked for it. We made them. Check them out today at truecrimegarage.com and all social media at True Crime Garage. That's it for today. I want to see everybody back here tomorrow in the garage. Until then, be good, be kind, and don't litter. You can start your day off right. When you find a professional on Angie to get your plumbing right first. Connect with skilled professionals to get all your home projects done well. Visit Angie.com. You can do this when you Angie that.